Black Kids White Coats YouTube channel. It is Lillian here today and I have Dr. Agumbiade. We're going to just be talking a little bit about what's going on right now with COVID and also with residency. He's a fourth year um, emergency medicine resident at Cook County, one of the top programs in the U.S. I would say. Um, so yeah, Dr. Agumbiade, thank you for joining us and we look forward to talking to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? No, of course. Thank you guys for having me. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, so I like uh, long walks on the beach. No, it's like, <laughs> no, so a little bit about myself. I, uh, I, I um, grew up in the Midwest, uh, born in Nigeria, grew up in the Midwest. Um, and uh, kind of like every other kind of black kid growing up, uh, just uh, trying to like survive and like, <laughs> um, get through school. Um, and then after that, I, uh, I think for me with regards to my, my pathway to medicine, I always had an interest. Um, parents, neither of my parents are uh, physicians, but they always encouraged it, which is always good having uh, people encouraging you to strive for something that you want. Um, but I, I think my, my earliest exposure to medicine were these uh, science camps uh, growing up in high school where it's during the summer. I grew up in St. Louis, but also in Indiana. Um, I went to these camps just over the summer where we just like went for a couple of weeks. We got to learn more about science and met up with people who are um, scientists, uh, not necessarily as many physicians, just more getting involved in people who are scientists uh, for the most part. Kind of got interested in that initially. Um, and after that, I left Indiana and never went back. Uh, I moved out to, uh, I was out in California for college, um, had a great time. Um, and I think you get more of your exposure to what you actually want to do when you're in college. So in college, I had some amazing experiences. Um, I was both like learning about physiology from this amazing emergency medicine doctor at the same time, who was uh, also a person of color. He himself was Hispanic, uh, but he was both an emergency medicine physician. He was a professor, um, but also he happened to be the uh, team uh, physician for the San Francisco 49ers at the time. I'm like, dope, this guy does everything. Uh, but he's also a great teacher, making people excited about medicine, excited about physiology. I'm like, this is awesome. I um, also had some like really amazing experiences in college too, where I got to travel with this other professor. We went to like England and France, meeting with people who got to do like the first and second facial transplants, like meeting with people who didn't uh, work in medicine, but work with a lot of physicians. So people who worked with um, uh, people who have facial disfigurements, dealing with the psychological and social aspects of dealing with disfigurement. And it, honestly, that trip helped me realize that medicine is such a vast uh, field. You can work with so many different things, with so many different people. And I don't know. I think around those points, those different people who were involved in my life, I was like, yo, I really, really want to do this medicine thing. Uh, but then I had to start like realizing all like the other issues you have to do to get into medical school from like the MCAT and like being in class with like crazy ass pre-meds. I was like, all right. <laughs> I was a pre-med, but I hated pre-meds. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the worst, <laughs> the worst for the worst. Anyways, um, but at that being said, you have to kind of work hard getting your resume and getting those things prepared at that time for it. Um, I didn't go into medic. I didn't go into medical school right away. I took a year off, which actually, if I could give any piece of advice right off the bat, like take a little bit of time off to actually make sure that medicine is what you want to do because it is a long career. Um, it's a very fulfilling career, but it's it's long. It's difficult. Um, but if it is what you want to do, then whenever you reflect on, oh, why the hell am I staying up studying so much? Why the hell am I doing all these different things? Why am I putting time into spending more time with this patient and trying to help them out, you'll realize this is actually what you wanted to do. So that was dope. So for that year, I enjoyed it. I did a little teaching. Um, I enjoyed my life. Uh, I hung out with friends. I saw family. It was, it was a great time. But even through it all, um, I still kind of wanted to do medicine. So um, I did it. I was fortunate enough to get accepted to University of Chicago's uh, Pritzker School of Medicine. And uh, so I moved to Chicago after being in the Bay Area for about five years. So I worked for a year in the area after. Um, and I got to medical school, which was, uh, woo, <laughs> medical school was, uh, medical school is no joke. I think if you are able to try to go to a medical school that at least has pass fail for, well, some of the medical schools have 
um, pass fail for all four years. But if you can go to ones, oh. with, yeah, I think like it's Yale or something like that. They have pass fail um, shelf optional. <laughs> <laughs> during all of the at Yale? No, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I'm like, okay, okay. Dang. Oh, one of my good friends, uh, she's um she's also black. She also in emergency medicine. I think she's like chief right now at UCSF. Uh she went to Yale. Um and we we did this uh, uh research fellowship for a year. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But she was telling me, yeah, man, we don't have, you know, we don't have gray like shelves or past fail. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, that's great. That's great. And that's also great. I'm like, that's insane. Um, but yeah, so if you can go to a place that at least has pass fail for first, second, and fourth year, it makes life easier because honestly, I think if you just go into those years trying to just learn as much as you can to learn, there is, I hate to say it, but there is some value of having grades doing third year. Mm -hmm. um, I hate I hated the grading system third year. I hated the subjectivity of it, but also at the same time, I think you need some things to be able to help people distinguish you because some people hate the standardized test. Completely understand that. Therefore, to be able to be um, you know to put a lot into a certain rotation to have people see that you're trying and having people see that you really want it, and at least having that subjective part um, and it's supposed to be somewhat objective. Um, help you in terms of getting honors. That's great. Um, and then some people who really do well standardized tests, if you can do really, really well on step one, step two, that's great as well. But you just need something to be able to help distinguish you because if you don't have anything, unfortunately, I think oftentimes it can hurt us more. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, because I think like at the end of the day, if you have great mentors, if you have like decent grades, if you have like decent um, uh, uh, board scores as in like step one, step two, um, you can usually kind of work your way into getting into a good position. Most mm -hmm. you can just mm, network well with your mentors and other things. Um, but you need something, but I don't think it's necessary for first, second or fourth year because it's just like more, it's, 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 it's unnecessary. Um, mm -hmm. third year, you just need something. And then after that, it doesn't really matter. But that being said, I think, um, for me, medical school was good. I won't say it was great. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Um, I, I enjoyed it, but I think third year, as we were talking earlier, um, third year is tough. Uh, third year is grueling. It's like working a full-time job, but also going to school and also these people who are annoying uh, who, when I say annoying, I use that word specifically because some of times your other um, co, uh, your colleagues in third year can be very annoying. Like people who were nice to you before flipped the script and now they're like gunners who are trying Look to- Look quickness. Back. Oh my God, it's like a flash in front of your <laughs> eyes. Like, like, who are you? Who are you? It was insane. Uh, I actually have a story from like third year. It was like doing my psych rotation. Uh, this uh, uh, other third year colleague of mine uh, <laughs> was doing psych. Like, okay, there was the, the, one of the residents, he, this guy was hella chill. Like he was this like psychiatrist, psychiatrist dude. He was like, he was chill. He's just asking us. We all live in Hyde Park and he didn't live there, but he had to travel. Uh, I think the next day he's like, Hey, do you guys know a place that does like same day dry cleaning? Right. And all I said was like, yeah, man, there are, I'm sure there are some places around. Just like, look it up on online. This other person, she calls like she calls some places in Hyde Park Yo. asking them about like same day dry cleaning when her ass knew that she wouldn't do that on like a regular basis. I'm like, are you serious? But yeah. what was, what was, what was, what happened next was amazing. Like this, like, like after she's like, oh, yo, these places, you know, hell for same day dry cleaning. Uh, the, the, the psych dude was like, yo, this is great. I appreciate you. But all of y'all are the same in my eyes, whether you do this or not. <laughs> I was like, oh, it was great. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. <laughs> Dang. Does it ever uh, work? Do you feel like, though? I don't know. Like, it doesn't work for me because I don't really care. Um, <laughs> right, they, as a resident, like, exactly. does that work for you either? Yeah. Exactly. Like, for me, as a fourth year resident now, I, I understand, I still understand and remember how difficult it is to be a third or fourth year because we have both mm -hmm. reticular ED, right? I mean, I think it's, for me, 
this whole evaluation about, oh, whether someone is like amazing or not. Like for me, I think people can determine whether someone is really great or not, depending, not necessarily actually even on the numerical value people give. Um, it's more the comments that people make in their evaluation, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, if you try hard with the patients that you get, if you work hard, if you're trying to be um, helpful with the team, I don't expect you to know everything, right? I'll ask you some questions just to teach you, not necessarily to pimp you. I'll pimp right. you because it's all part of teaching anyways, but- to, Is it though? Is it really necessary though? <laughs> when I say pimp for me, it's just asking you questions, right? I'm not asking you questions to try to see if you know more than I do. I'm asking you questions for me personally to see what some things you don't know so I can teach you. Yeah. Oh, no, you're wrong. Some people will pimp you just to be like, oh, I know more than you, right? Or yeah. blah, blah, blah. But for me, I don't really care. If you don't even, if you don't answer the questions I have correctly, I don't care. I'll teach you because for me, it's, it's helpful in that sense. But also for me, like, you know, that's not what's going to make or break what I say about you and your evaluation. Mm -hmm. It's you actually asking the questions about, oh, what is this? What is that? It's, it's you like help me out with a certain procedure or you being excited about it. Because at the end of the day, like, it's not, um, um, I mean, this is my philosophy, like my job, because I already know how difficult third and fourth year is to help you do your best. That being said, if you are somebody who is not necessarily uh, helpful on the team, if you're someone who is like, I see like on your phone all the time, as opposed to like asking what you do with the team and within emergency medicine, if we are all very, very busy for the eight to 12 hours we're there. So yeah. it actually makes a difference. Um, like, so for me, when I say pimping, I don't use it to make you look bad, which I think some other people may do or to like find knowledge gaps, therefore to make you to embarrass you. For me, it's so I can like see how I could teach you what you like to learn about. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But let me, let me be honest. Not everybody does that. Yeah. <laughs> like if you're in surgery, uh, nope. <laughs> Not necessarily. Or even sometimes in internal medicine, like dude, like some people aren't so nice, but I think honestly, I feel like you're bashing a whole field. <laughs> I'm sure there are some people in emergency medicine that do that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That is true. Uh, but let's be honest. Some of these surgeons, uh, it could be worse. <laughs> it's okay. They could come at me. They could come at me. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's no, but uh, you're right. Not everyone is the same in every field, right? Um, not everyone in emergency medicine will be nice. Not everyone in emergency medicine, I think, will be laid back and try to teach you. I can only do in um, as much as I can to help the people who I uh, interact with. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say within emergency medicine, for the most part, people tend to be a bit more laid back, more, more or less than other fields. But I think that's also what our stereotype is, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, honestly, I think like for me, just to kind of put it back together, third year was, um, third year was tough, but it was like a very, it, it was a, it was a difficult year, but also a year in which I think it made me realize I did still want to, I did still want to be in medicine, um, regardless of how difficult it can be as a year, physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Um, it's still a year where I'm like, yo, I still like taking care of these patients and helping them out, which is Great. Um, and then actually after my third year, I, I left for a year and I went to the NIH uh, in Bethesda, Maryland to do research, um, which is a phenomenal year. It's uh, the MRSP program. Um, it's a phenomenal year where you get to spend it at the NIH and you literally get to do research in any field with any um, scientists you want. It could be anything from basic science research to clinical research to it's, it was amazing. You have these lectures from these, literally these, um, people who are like pushing the field of different fields from immunology to cancer biology. It's amazing. Um, and you also have a year that's not as grueling as your third year. Um, you can apply either after your second year or your third year. It was an amazing year. I got to spend more time um, just doing a lot of other things as well in addition to doing research. The research I ended up doing was really, really awesome. It was looking at, uh, it was looking at people on dialysis and trying to see whether there is an actual survival and um, survival advantage for ethnic minorities on dialysis. It's crazy because I started this pro that project in like 2015, 2016. It didn't get published until oh, earlier this year. <laughs> Yeah, and it was like, uh, yeah, it was crazy because we went through multiple ways of um, trying to show because it's a very, very, oh, okay. a very, very analytical project. Um, we we had some like poster presentations, but the actual um, uh, paper wasn't published until more recently. But yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great year, phenomenal year. Recommended for anybody who maybe 
have had a really tough third year or even are applying to a much more competitive field and are looking for right. something else to boost their application because in addition to being able to do a lot of amazing research, you have these people who can write you amazing letters of recommendation, which to be honest, at the end of the day, especially in the smaller fields, go a long, long way. A lot of people who, uh, also people of color who are applying into anything from like ortho to opto to so many other fields as well, who is a really, really great um, thing to add to their CV, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, so th that part of my um, third year, sorry, that part of my med school life was phenomenal. And I came back, uh, I finished fourth year. Fourth year was a breeze, honestly. Fourth year was great. Uh, just like, you know, you interviewed, after you interviewed, like chill for a bit. And after I match, I was like, dude, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> exactly. Um, if, if anything I can give anyone for advice, enjoy your fourth year as much as you can. Um, I think for the people who are currently applying because of uh, COVID-19, yeah. fourth year may be a little bit uh, difficult. Um, and I think it's difficult because especially the people who are applying into things that require a ways, which include emergency medicine, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be hard because I don't know when the hospital is going to start allowing medical students to come back, which is very so difficult. So they actually had updates um, and they said that OAs aren't recommended unless like you, you don't have like a, like a program at your school or something like that. Like there are exceptions here and there. So see, that's also like very tough, right? Because for some people who, let's say you're like the middle of the way applicant, if you go do an away rotation at, let's say, like any program um, and you do really, really well, that can really, really help your application. So now I feel like the applications are probably going to skew towards people who come from like bougie schools with like, I don't know. It's, yeah, they're it, going to have to figure out a way to navigate yeah. that as well. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's kind of tough. That kind of goes back to what I was saying um, about needing a little, a few other um, points of objective um, evaluation. Because things like, actually, for example, with step one potentially being phased out, I, I, I don't know how I feel about that. I know like step one sucks as an exam. It's difficult for, I'm serious. Like it's mm -hmm. difficult to study for if you like don't, if you're not great at standardized tests, it's like the bane of your existence. Um, but then at the same time, like it's, it's like a balance, right? For some people who feel like they don't do well in terms of interacting with people and being the person people might like during third year, they're disadvantaged, but if they do decently on standardized exams, like they have that, right? Versus mm -hmm. like vice versa. And also I feel it's like the same way with the way rotations, right? If you can, if you haven't necessarily done as well third year for various reasons, maybe you had a tough time third year, yeah. maybe family stuff happens, like life doesn't stop happening because you're in medical school or residency. Like away rotations were a way to help have you go somewhere else, have other people lay eyes on you. And at least I know being on the interviewing side for residency, um, if you have a good like away rotation from let's say if you at Cook County had an away rotation from let's say LA County or Highland Hospital and you did really really well and you, let's say your numbers weren't good or mm -hmm. you didn't do as well third year, we'd be like f all that like this is an amazing letter of recommendation right. for from this program that's like on par with us like we're actually going to give this person like a good um opportunity and, and I, so it, it it's just all these things actually could help particularly applicants of color too and it just kind of sucks that <sighs> COVID's kind of screwed it up for yeah a lot of people yeah so yikes um but anyways uh fourth year um fourth year was a breeze for me it was great uh, um because i just like interviews and everything i was just well, how did you choose the emergency medicine Oh, that's a good question. Honestly, I loved emergency medicine. I had, I realized I had a lot of influence or not a lot of influence, a lot of um, people in my life who were in emergency medicine from early on. So from my mentor um, in undergrad, who was the person who's an emergency medicine physician right. and also team right. and all that stuff, like I like, he had like the flexibility to do all those things. I'm like, no, oh, that's dope. Um, so I was pretty excited about that. And actually very early on in medical school, one of my mentors um, was this like dope, amazing black boss lady physician, Dr. Kimmy Carter, University of Chicago. My, uh, my first year of medical school, we had something where uh, called longitudinal program where we partnered up with different people in different specialties. And we just shadowed them for a couple of times a year. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Carter was my mentor uh, 
first year, which is awesome. And I was like, okay, she's like kind of amazing. And this feels kind of cool. So as I went through um, all the things during, say, I already got exposure first year, third year, I like certain things. Uh, but then I was like, you know, I still kind of like emergency medicine a lot. Like I can, it like, I personally like shift work. You see a lot of patients, you get to do a lot with your hands, you get to mm -hmm. do a lot of procedures. You still get to interact with like patients. And I think like bedside manner is really, really important there too. Um, and also when I interact with people within the emergency department, it was really awesome. Before I left my year away, I did like my fourth year rotation early on um, before I left. So I did that rotation. I'm like, dude, these people are awesome. They're smart. Like they're dope. And like it was, I had a really, really great time. Um, and now, although I told myself I was in between emergency medicine and anesthesia, I was like, nah, I want to do emergency medicine. Um, so it was like really, really great. And that's how I made that decision. Um, and actually, I, I never, I've never really regretted that decision. As we were talking about earlier, one of the things I didn't mention, um, when I was in D.C. for that year, rather than mm -hmm. Maryland, uh, one of the things I stumbled upon was I found uh, stand-up comedy. Uh, I, like, I had a lot more time on my hands, so I just, like, I leave Bethesda, Maryland, go down to D.C. area, and I just, like, yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just be at these open mic nights like like every other night just like working on stuff and I honestly like stand-up comedy was it's hard like you you're out there you're like getting on stage and you know honestly I wasn't funny when I was starting most people aren't um and you fail like repeatedly like mm -hmm. starting over and over and over again it was awesome it's like it's kind of like in a way kind of a metaphor for kind of like medicine there's some days you'll go out like you you just feel like you failed right you suck mm -hmm. and you get back and do it over and over and over again keep trying to get better get better get better um and it was just great for that sense but uh emergency medicine still allowed me to continue those things even after i moved back to chicago mm -hmm. um and i matched emergency medicine at cook county um, it's allowed me to continue those pursuits and it's been, uh, yeah, it's been pretty dope. All right. So let's move on to residency. Kind of tell us how that's been. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm at the tail end of my residency right mm -hmm. now. I have less than two months left. I'm literally counting down the days and the shifts. <laughs> um, but residency has been, um, it's been great. Um, you know how I said, uh, third year is like, okay, but residency has been great. Uh, I think once you make the excuse me, once you make the transition from medical student to becoming a physician, um, as a resident, you get a lot more responsibility, but also you get, you start learning actually how to be a physician within your own realms of what you're doing, right? Um, I think intern year for everybody is rough because you know nothing. Uh, it's more like Jon Snow. I'm not sure if you watch Game of Thrones. Anyways, uh, no longer relevant. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, you don't know that much. Um, but you're working hard on learning just the day in, day out of how to do certain things. Uh, within emergency medicine, you start learning how to do certain procedures. You start, start learning how to do, also interact with nurses, how to get certain things done. Um, and over the years, you start kind of working on becoming more confident, knowing more. And it's not necessarily more, it's more about, oh, you have to study all the time. It's like how you deal with certain things in certain situations. You start learning the art of medicine because medicine's never been black and white. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of nuance, especially as you get more into it. Also, one of the, um, I guess, surprising blessings that I've had is that um, in my residency class, it's... Honestly, going through medicine as like a, one, as a black person, but two, as a black man, you are always one of a handful, always. Whether in undergrad, being pre-med, in medical school, and my medical class was pretty small. We had 88 people in my medical school class, and of like my starting class, I took a year off. Um, there were five of us initially, and then one dropped out. And then I know, right? It's it's funny. Like this this person, she came up to me on like the like first or second day, and she's like, "There's five of us." I'm like, "Yeah, I know." And then she <laughs> left. I'm like, "Dang." No. <laughs> Anyways, um, like there's not that many of you, right? But um, I like I remember on my match day when I opened up, like when I sent us like the list of people who are in a residency class, and they were there were four black people, right? Mm -hmm. And like out of four of us, there were like three black dudes, right? Cause like, um, I wrote a, I know, right? I wrote an article not too long ago 
about why there are so, actually my intern, yeah, about why there are so few black men in medicine. Mm. I'm just going over the numbers of how like we're the least represented of people in medicine. Um, when I saw that <laughs> match list, I'm like, holy shit. And to actually take it a step further than that, in my residency class, there were more people of color than they were uh, non-Hispanic whites. Yeah, it was, wow. yeah, it was, it was amazing. But I think one of the things I, I didn't realize how amazing that was because um, me and all the black, re- like the other black residents were like, we're very, very close. Like mm-hmm. we, like we message every day. We, it's like both been a, a way of support, but also promotion, but also just like people being friends and having each other's backs. It's, mm-hmm. it's been, it's been, it's been amazing. I guess I'd never really thought about how amazing having that support system is until I had it. Um, like these, like these other people become like my closest friends and also greatest colleagues. Um, yeah. Like I, you know, it, 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 it's just been great. Uh, and you just never really know what you're missing until you have it. Uh, yeah. But also that being said, I think about having my class, my residency class being uh, predominantly people of color. I, I still remember um, <laughs> election day in 2016, it was my intern year. And that we come, like, I remember the next day was our conference and I come back and there was like this cloud of just tension of everyone Mm -hmm. feeling so down. And it was amazing not to have to say anything to the people in my class because we all knew because like, you know, we all were either people of color or um, first generation immigrants or Hispanic Americans or, um, any of those other things, right? We all had family who were directly affected by the results of the elections. And of course, the last three and a half, whatever years has been terrible because of it. But being in a program we'll that- get too political here, but yeah. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to. But being in a program, <laughs> can we not, can we not? <laughs> no, but, 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 but being in a program in which like people um, understood that you didn't have to say anything was very, very awesome. I don't, you can't really, designed that it was just I was just handed that and that was great but like having that it was been really really awesome yeah that's all um, so dope yeah um but also like being a physician at Cook County you also kind of end up realizing how important it is to be present in the community in which you are trying to take care of right like our our, our patients are predominantly um black hispanic and people from all over the world, right? So like for us as a program, um, we do a lot of outreach, um, Mm -hmm. both trying to encourage the communities of color to pursue medicine, um, but also community service and also other things within um, a a local Chicago community. Um, I think people within the Chicago line area know that if you're sick and, you know, you're worried about anything, just go to county and, you know, it, it, it feels great to have that type of um, status within this community, but it's also responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, also, like a, as, a, as like a, a black man, you know, it's that responsibility um, to take care of that community. Uh, I think our patients like seeing that there are other black providers in the emergency department. Um, and it's, it's, it's great to be able to provide that. Um, yeah. It's dope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Diversity is definitely, I think it's very important, especially when I'm applying. I'll definitely yeah. consider that all of that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's extremely important, honestly. Like I, it's one of the things I, when I was applying for a fellowship, I, I made it a point to ask um, about the diversity, not necessarily just of like the, like the people in who we're taking care of, which I think is also important too, but also the diversity of the program. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting because I'm actually going to program, which I think it's not Can you actually. Tell us what fellowship you're doing? Yeah, I'm doing an ultrasound fellowship at UCLA Reagan. All of you, um, starting in a month and a half. <laughs> TikTok. Yeah, I know, right? Talk, talk, TikTok. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty exciting. Um, uh, my program I'm going into is not as diverse as the current one I'm going into. Uh, but that being said, that. LA as a place, it's a place where we take care of a lot of uh, a diversity of patients, which I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Maybe I can help them. Actually, not maybe. I'm definitely going to try to help them improve the diversity one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you, I think having people who think about it and make it a goal to improve upon this is important to the process of actually improving and reaching that goal. Mm-hmm. 
Awesome. And can you talk a little bit more about, I called it a hobby earlier. It's definitely like a career right now. Can you talk a little bit more about the stand-up comedy and like some other stuff you do to keep yourself sane while you're in the Yeah, room. yeah. Um, so I do stand-up comedy. And I also do a lot of writing as well. Um, stand-up comedy, yeah, it, it, it started off as a hobby, uh, something to try out when I was in D.C., but it's turned into this, I guess, also a second passion, hopefully maybe other second career as well. Um, stand-up comedy is, is fun, but it's difficult, but it's also an amazing way to talk about difficult things. Mm. Um, there's a lot that actually goes into crafting a great joke. There's a lot that goes into crafting um, a routine that's great. I, uh, when I started doing, it, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like, what, like, you know, what's all these things that you know, I can do? I can do this, you know, like, you know, there's this confidence going into be like, yo, I can do whatever I want, but <laughs> it takes time to be able to kind of find your own style, find your voice, but also find how to make certain things funny. Um, I, I like joking around about anything and everything. The, and I think the better stand-up comedians are the one who just joke around about their life, but also talk about difficult things within that. Um, so for me, I, I, I don't know, I've joked around about being, oh, one of my favorite jokes I always start out with is uh, how I was, a, I was a black man who sucked at basketball growing up, <laughs> which is real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I also talk about everything else. Like I talk about being a physician, talk about patients, it could be difficult. One of the wow. jokes that I've loved the most, I've worked so long on crafting is this joke I talk about the uh the double standards of the opioid epidemic um uh and also uh how that plays out within me being a physician which people are like damn how do you talk about that but it's like it took time to heavy get topic well dang yeah uh, it took time for me to get there and, it, and you, it takes like a certain rhythm you don't talk about it at the beginning it's not gonna be your first joke you win people over and then once you win people over you 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 ease into it with different other jokes and you like mm. get up with it and then you gotta come back and talk about a different joke to kind of break it it's great it's great um <laughs> We do build and talk about so many different things. I, I think about some of these, uh, some of the comedic legends that I respect so much. And one of them that I think everyone talks about is Dave Chappelle. But when you think about, when you actually look at Dave Chappelle's old work, like before, you know, even, even before the Chappelle show, he was talking about police brutality, what everyone's talking about mm. now like before everybody else, right? Like in like most hilarious way, but real stuff. Or even one of my... One of my favorite routines of his is he talks about something we all, I guess we grew up in the West, we all can relate to, which is Sesame Street. But he uses Sesame Street as an avenue to talk about homelessness wow. and people being like bougie and like ignoring homeless people. I'm like, this man is a, and he, he literally is because he, <laughs> he knows all these pop, he talks about these topics. And he's not like, I think some of, um, some, I think, other comedians who just talk about, like, random, silly, crass stuff all the time. To be able to talk about those difficult topics and hear mm -hmm. people laugh, but also think that's, like, next-level comedy that I think only, like, kind of some of, like, these legends from Dave, Richard Pryor, and other people we're going to talk about. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a healthy, like, outlet. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Being it's able good. to talk about all the stuff you go on in life and all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, it, it's been great, and and like writing has also been another great outlet for me as well. Um, I like from that article I told you about. Um, I'll post that in the description. Yeah, and also even now, I I recently wrote another article about um how the COVID epidemic um is I think a calling for us to have universal universal health care. Um, I think what did I tell? It was like the um. I think the COVID calamity, uh, Black Lives and the Biden burden kind of using it as a way to talk about how I think currently a lot of people are saying kind of build upon Obamacare or build upon this, build upon that. But I think for me, I realized particularly working at Cook County as a uh, public safety at a hospital, Medicaid is fine. It's something, but it's subpar, right? You create like a two tier system and actually legitimately what would do a lot to help not necessarily just people who are poor and not uh, people who are poor and underserved, but just everyone to have more equality is having a universal healthcare system where your healthcare is not the same as, is not this different from my healthcare. Therefore mm -hmm. we have, I got it's, it's one of the few things we can actually do that kind of puts us all on the same level, but um, I think it was like a, it's an article that I really, really wanted to write. And like, I think through writing, you can also talk about a lot of the things you care about too. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh, 
Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and is there like, are there, um, I don't know, websites or things that we can check out to see some of the material you've already put out in terms of the stand-up comedy and yeah. the writing? Yeah, um, my website, I think an, I, I have two URLs, but probably the easiest way to remember it is uh, <laughs> AK Tells Jokes is the easiest one. Okay. Or if you wanted to try it, uh, you could be akagumbiade.com, but I think AK Tells Jokes is easier for people to remember. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And that's for their writing and... It's everything. Um, it's just everything. my website. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else like advice or things that you wanted to share before we check that? Yeah. Um, I think if you are Black uh, or a person of color going in, into medicine, it's important to, if you can, find your mentors and support systems early on. Um, as we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, um, it's a long, rough, and hard process. You will doubt yourselves many times. You'll yeah. have people make you feel like you are less than often. But the thing is that you are not less than and you are more than capable, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much literature talking about how we, as Black people or people of color, doubt ourselves pretty early on because people making us feel uh, uh, less than or making us feel like the other. But the thing is that we work hard and by working hard, we deserve to do this just as much as anybody else. And actually, I would argue that we are in a great position to provide care because we understand the discrimination that people get who look like us. Therefore, we're able to kind of provide care that's without a lot of those things that some of our other colleagues may not necessarily see because of um, perhaps preconceived notions and other things as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think one of the most important things I've realized through this process is that having a good support system will help us be able to survive the long growing pathway through medicine. Um, and yeah, and to be honest, look for these mentors and support systems in places you may not necessarily always expect it. Um, and yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your knowledge of wisdom and sharing your story on the channel. Thank you for the um, opportunity. <laughs> Yay. Um, like, comment, and subscribe as usual. Let's continue this conversation. Be sure to check out his channel, his con or his website and his content. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>